Okay, folks, everybody hear me? I hear you. Okay. That means if one person can hear me, there's a good chance other people can hear me too. All right. Excellent. So I'm Dr. John Lee. For those of you that haven't had um, your um, outpatient rotation and me, you get me on either Wednesday or Friday morning for sessions in dermatology. Um, and what I uh, do in those sessions is an introduction and we spend a lot of time looking at morphology and basics. Um, these sessions uh, are a chance for me to go a little bit deeper in the uh, uh, pathology and what can happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm going to show you uh, my first slide. Um, I've learned this is not like Zoom and everything disappears when I show my, my first slide. So I'm going to rely on you to uh, uh, give me feedback that you can see it. Here we go. Can you see it? Yes. OK, so you should be seeing um, a list of um, problems that uh, we encounter with the skin uh, in family practice clinic, not in dermatology clinic. I'm not selecting these cases based on what we see in dermatology. I'm selecting it on a review I did of the literature, and I found four uh, studies looking at the problem a little bit differently, and I mishmashed this list of, uh, in rank order, the prevalence of what we see in, in uh, family practice clinic, skin problems in family practice clinic. And um, so I'm going to I got three hours with you guys in the, over the next uh, uh, two weeks, and I'm going to try to get as far down this list as I can. Uh, I have a lot to say about each one, so it's not going to be as simple um, a, as it looks. But um, you can rest assured the topics I cover are going to be more common than the topics we don't we don't get to. Um, as those of you who have had the seminars that I, I hold, uh, you, you know that I really highly recommend uh, this book for primary care uh, dermatology. Um, uh, up to date's very good, but if you want, uh, if you got a half hour that you'd like to spend with one particular problem, this is really the best resource for a primary care doctor. And I, I want to emphasize, I'm not a dermatologist. Uh, uh, I hope you all know uh, by now, I am a family practitioner. Um, and I did the residency at Contra Costa a long, long time ago, when it was still a general practice residency, um, in fact. So I'm coming at this uh, from a primary care doc um, who is uh, uh, learned a little bit about uh, skin problems in, in the context of, of primary care. I've been a registrar in uh, uh, dermatology for uh, uh, about 25 years. Um, and what I like about this book is how, how well organized it is. This is the whole universe of um, uh, dermatological problems. So, uh, growths and miscellaneous, we're not going to spend any time on. What we're going to spend time on are rashes to start with. I'll get to growths, believe me, but we're going to start off with rashes. And the world of rashes is broken down to with epidermal involvement and without epidermal involvement. Um, and there are six kinds of, of epidermal involvement. Um, and if you can just decide if you, uh, hey, I think the epidermis is involved. It's right on the top of the skin. Uh, I can feel it. Um, 
And you can feel every one of these things except hypopigmented, right? So um, if, if you think it, you can get it into one of these categories, and we'll be talking more about each category, uh, then uh, if you think you've got it into um, uh, a papule, uh, off you go to the text, to the chapter associated with that um, uh, uh, morphology. And then you get the things that you are, are likely to see in primary care um, uh, inflammatory uh, papules. Um, so uh, if you decide that, huh, I don't think there's any epidermal involvement, um, you go down here without epidermal involvement, and okay, you wind up at this node here, red, without uh, epidermal involvement. And so the next question is, is it blanchable or non-blanchable? And um, now we've gone from the top of uh, uh, things being common uh, to the bottom of my list, and we'll get back to that in just a second. But if it is blanchable um, and it's generalized, uh, then uh, it's going to be um, either uh, viral or drug. So you see a general rash is kind of at the bottom of my list. So rash are the bookends um, of, of the list. Um, and I hope we'll, we'll get to that, but just know um, you, you're going to get 90% of generalized rash by taking a good history for viral infection or, or, or a drug. Uh, so let's start with common rash. Um, what, what are the top two causes? Contact and, and atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, and um, here we are. It's the top of our list with epidermal involvement. And um, here, the clue is, um, huh, this is contact. You all, uh, I, I wish I had some way of getting feedback and watching heads nod or, or something, but maybe this is the last time uh, I'll have to do this virtually and I'll be back to seeing your faces. Um, and I'm sure you all are going to appreciate that day uh, uh, even more than me. Um, but here, um, you'll appreciate this is contact because it's linear, right? Very few things, there's an exception, but the very few things um, are, are linear. And you can look at this, and the, the key word um, that I use for uh, eczematous change is juicy. It just looks juicy. In the acute in the acute phase, and the other reason I like looking, Bill, is that they give you these uh, schematic diagrams associated with everything. And for me, as a primary care doc, in uh, uh, what I had a hard time appreciating is how deep in the skin uh, is the pathology that we're dealing with, and. Uh, the striking thing uh, for me to realize was that most uh, pathology is in the, the, the epidermis, the paper thin layer. That accounts for an awful lot of the mischief. Uh, and all, so all six of uh, the uh, with epidermal changes, and that's where we're going to be spending a lot of our time. Um, uh, are readily accessible right on right on the top. So you got this this juicy layer, and that means that we can do a lot of topical uh, treatment. So this is another reason I like looking, Bill. Um, so contact. Um, uh, here's another line, uh, a line of of exposure. And so you're all thinking uh, with your detective hats on, oh, this is uh, a contact to uh, elastic, and you'd be right. Um, here, uh, you have a, a, a brighter red, and I'd say that this is a tip-off 
for contact. There, it's, it's a little bit brighter red acutely than is a, a topic. Not always, but it, it fits a, a, a pattern. And so you keep on your detective hat. And can I tell you that I've had a, a, a doctor uh, come into my clinic who had no idea that a rash just like this that he had could be caused by ski goggles. Uh, but they were um, aftershave. Um, so y y you just put on your detective hat and think it through and take a history. Um, hair dye. Uh, face mask is we're all uh, exposed to these days, uh, but also CPAP. Uh, uh, here, uh, the, you're all thinking, wait a minute, this must be nickel, and you'd be right. Uh, belt buckle watch, nickel in, in uh, 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 jewelry and, and wrist products. Now you look at this and you say, hey, this is, this is pretty bright red, but it, it really is symmetrical. Now I can tell you, I've seen a contact patient, another doctor, a radio, uh, I remember the doctors, the radiologist, and he thought he had some uh, rare thing. He actually thought he had lupus somehow. And we sat down and we took a history and he was building a deck and he was uh, carrying planks of wood uh, cradled across his arm. This was the, the that was from uh, the sap from from the wood, uh, but he he didn't know, and I'm surprised uh, at how much I don't know about myself until somebody takes a look and says, "Well, well, John, wait a minute, you're doing this." Uh, oh yeah, that could do it. Um, and so uh, uh, contacts a possibility, but this particular patient, it's a little bit more chronic, and so this is our first case of atopic dermatitis. Now, um, you're most likely you're going to see that in uh, pediatrics. And uh, for those of you who've done your pediatric rotations, you, you've seen it um, and how common uh, it is. Um, and uh, the, the good news that you can tell my mo mother is 70% of, of uh, uh, patients will uh, remit uh, before uh, adolescence. Um, so this is the, again from looking bill. Now you, you go from the acute to the chronic and you get lichenification, a thickening uh, of the epidermis from the constant uh, mechanical disturbance of this scratching, uh, which makes it worse. Um, and uh, chronic, uh, you get uh, lichenification in, in adults. Also in adults, which I've come to appreciate, is a lot of um, uh, rashes around the neck are actually a topic. So a, a diagram like this is useful. And there's some interesting uh, details here. Uh, the distribution in kids is different than the uh, distribution in adults. I have no I idea why that is. But if you uh, look on kids, it's extensor. So extensor knees, extensor elbows. Can you all see the arrow when I'm wiggling it? No, we don't see the arrow. Oh, no. Oh, I'm, uh, when I do Zoom, you can see the arrow. That's a shame. OK, I'm glad to know that. Um, all right, so uh, knees and, and, and elbows uh, for kids, um, and then uh, flexors, um, the anacubital and the popliteal fossa uh, for, for adults. Kids, um, more on the face. Um, adults, um, also uh, on the face and, and neck in, in particular, but both hands. The hands are really, really susceptible to all kinds of stuff. Because think about it, they're, 
uh, like the epidermis is our uh, boundary to the world, uh, uh, that the hands are that on steroids, right? The hands are turbocharged because they're what we touch in, in, in our environment. And uh, we're going to see uh, examples of how uh, hands uh, in, uh, in people with a, a, a atopic diathesis are really going to have a problem with chemicals too. So, um, and we see some people with obviously pure uh, uh, chemical hand dermatitis, but um, uh, that can uh, be compounded um, with uh, people with a, a atopic diathesis. So chronic popliteal. Now, I'm not going to uh, sit here and show you all kinds of photos uh, of the full range. You can do that uh, on your own. So uh, homework assignment number one, go to DermNet NZ. NZ stands for New Zealand, and I'll explain why New Zealand is so interested in Derm in a second. Um, and uh, you can go there and search for whatever you want and ask for images and up it pops. This is uh, Tom Page's favorite um, a resource for look, uh, for finding and showing uh, images. Those of you who had the pleasure of working alongside our board certified dermatologist knows that he uses this a lot, and I recommend it for learning. You can also um, learn. Uh, uh, they they have text, uh, and you can learn from it. But I, I frankly, I think up to date's um, a, a little bit more concise for text and easier to navigate. But for, for photos, this is, this is your place to do your, your homework. Um, all right, so the infant, uh, the head, uh, and he, here uh, we see uh, a typical thing and, and drooling makes it worse. Why? Because drooling actually dries out the skin. And, uh, and what we're gonna learn um, is that dry skin is is the enemy uh, first and foremost. Um, the, the central area uh, in this kid spared. Um, uh, to what role does diet play? We we really don't know. I mean, even less about uh, um, uh, air uh, pollens, but. Um, these are the, the most common things uh, that can uh, make uh, eczema worse. And these uh, is a little bit longer list with a little more details. Uh, this is available in a, uh, another good book called Habif. I'll show you the, the cover of that uh, when we get to another topic. All right, so um, uh, a kid with a, a generalized uh, uh, eczema, and uh, you've got a, a lot of uh, work uh, to uh, educate the mother on how best to manage this. Um, again, uh, a case of saliva making things worse. A lip smacker can, um, uh, with a uh, eczematous uh, diathesis, uh, can uh, cause a flare locally. Here's the hands. Um, in, in this case, it's both. Um, uh, atopic and uh, plus chemical. Uh, this is chronic. Uh, the risks in particular um, in atopic dermatitis, uh, lichenification, um, and as I said, the neck, uh, quite uh, a common target. Um, and uh, as uh, shown there. Now this is a trick. I'm just going to give you a second to see if you can s figure out how's Dr. Lee trying to trick me. So um, this is seborrhea, and it's a little bit more scaly, uh, a little bit more scaly. And for those of you who have seen uh, uh, seborrhea, you know, looking at the face, you have that central nasolabial fold, the scaliness, you have dandruff, the medial part of the eyebrows. So it's a central part of the body and it also can affect the groin, um, uh, uh, seborrhea. Um, so uh, 
this is not atopic dermatitis. It's um, in the nature of a scaling uh, lesion. And I hope we'll get to uh, 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 the papillosquamous diseases, psoriasis, lichen planus, uh, and, and seborrhea uh, in due course. Um, the uh, eyes are also a target, particularly uh, the upper lids. Um, you cannot use uh, steroids uh, around the eye. Here's where topical tacrolimus uh, uh, has really helped us out um, in, in uh, recent uh, decade. Um, so IgE is a, a marker for extrinsic, extrinsic atopic dermatitis. There is an intrinsic, but it's, it usually doesn't come until adulthood, and it's a minority. Uh, the vast majority, 80%, uh, IgE can, can be a marker. So if you're kind of scratching your head and you can't figure it out, you can get a, a, a blood test. This is another trick question. So I'm going to give you a second to think about how I'm trying to trick you with this. And if, if we were interacting like normal human beings, I'd see somebody raise their hand. I'd see somebody uh, 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 flash me a quizzical look. Uh, I'd see somebody uh, looking at their cell phone. Uh, and uh, what I'm trying to trick you here is to realize that the, the main, the dominant morphology here is, is pustular. So this is rosacea, um, and we're dealing with another uh, uh, epidermal change, pu pustular. All right, now um, I want to uh, describe to you something that uh, uh, exists along with atopic dermatitis, and you should know about it. It's loosely associated. It can uh, exist independently. But because it's so common, and they say two to ten percent, but you know, I, I see it um, since I've appreciated what it was. I've seen it in my relatives, uh, in my friends. It's just a common um, uh, hyperkeratosis around the hair follicle, uh, keratosis uh, pilaris, and. You don't have to treat it at all. A lot of uh, just reassurance, hey, this is a normal variant. It's not uh, pathology. But some uh, folks just don't like the cosmetic aspect. And you can start off with ammonia lactate. Uh, that's over the counter. So that's, that, that's where you start. You can go to the big guns. I'll come back to this in a second. Um, and it can get worse. It can it can get uh, uh, a pustular. The pustules aren't infectious pustules um, in the beginning. They can get that way, and we'll see a case. But you, uh, you've probably seen it on uh, uh, friends or, or or relatives. What is that? Keratosis pilaris. Very common. Um, and now we're we're getting more pustular more pustular, and maybe even infectious. Anything that can be pustular can be invaded secondarily. Really bad case, keratosis, polaris, uh, rubra. Um, and we come back, uh, they come back and th they say, ah, oh, that amlactin just did, didn't work. It helped maybe 10%, but what else do you got? Well, you can you can try Retin-A, which is what we use to cause peeling of the skin and in, in acne. And again, you're just trying to peel that extra uh, keratotic layer off from around the hair follicle. Um, you can all, also do salicylic acid, uh, but the, the 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 strongest one is uh, urea, 20 20 percent. And I've been pleasantly surprised that um, uh, that's covered um, in uh, most of uh, uh, third party. Uh, so but, uh, I, you don't go to that right away. 
And, and, and frankly, maybe you'd even try the urea before you try the, the, the Retin-A, because the Retin-A can, can cause harsh peeling. And also, you put it on at night because uh, you don't want people uh, walking around during the day because it's a photosensitizer. So uh, probably uh, do urea first and save this for the very last. But it's, I, I spent this much time on it because it's very common. Um, also associated with atopic dermatitis are these uh, pale uh, spots. And I'll give you a second before I tell you what this is, because I want your active mind to be thinking what you, what you know. And some of you, if I were asking, some of you would raise your hands and they, you'd tell me, hey, this is pityriasis alba. And, and you'd be right. And you treat that the same way you treat uh, atopic dermatitis, which we'll talk about uh, in, in just a second. There's a second problem with this kid, and we'll come back to it. Now that you know there's a second problem, just, just uh, uh, file that away for a later um, uh, topic. All right. So this is my sketch of all the factors that can uh, lead uh, into uh, a flare of uh, eczema or atopic dermatitis. The basic problem that everybody has to understand, it is a diathesis of the genes. It, you're, you're not doing anything wrong when you get involved in any of these other factors that feed into it. The basic problem uh, don't blame uh, your actions or you're not behaving responsibly. The, the, uh, responsibly, the basic problem is you've been dealt a tough hand and you've got to be uh, uh, careful about these other things that can act as, as triggers in your skin. We've already talked about food and uh, uh, one study showed you look at these uh, um, uh uh, six things, and, and, and this knocks off 90% of uh, food allergies that contribute to uh, atopy. Uh, irritants, uh, contact, wool, well known, uh, uh, avoid wool, 100% uh, cotton. Um, and this feeds into something that I didn't put in my original uh, sketch, but it's heat and perspiration, which obviously probably relates uh, 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 to wool. Uh, so, and avoiding tight clothing. Just in, and that might be why flexor surfaces in adults are, are more uh, involved as, as they uh, get uh, skin on skin uh, more. Um, dryness. I'd say this is where I start with a, a mother that brings that kid in that had eczema all over her body. How uh, what soap are you using? How often? And quite uh, uh, common, the best thing I can do is not to add anything for the mother to do, but to subtract something. You don't have to use soap on your kid every day, particularly in the areas where they're having problems. Uh, unless they've been outside playing in the mud, you don't have to put soap on it at all for a long period of time. Um, and just subtracting the soap uh, helps. Uh, what kind of soap is important too? And for areas that just have to be cleansed and are showing signs of uh, atopy, um, you can use a soap substitute. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples later. So Climate is a factor too in this. Uh, atopic dermatitis gets worse in the, in the winter time. Why? Because of central heating and furnaces pull uh, particularly dry out uh, uh, the air. Um, and we'll talk more about what to do with dry skin. Um, it, it's very interesting. Uh, recent data is coming out that city kids um, have. Uh, a higher incidence of uh, eczema than rural kids do. Huh, that's interesting. And um, uh, one thought is that uh, rural kids are 
um, exposed to dirt more. And being exposed to dirt is what we're we're supposed to do as as kids. And if you're excessively clean, uh, somehow that uh, 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 reduces your resistance to develop developing problems from your ge genetic predisposition. Um, emotion and stress certainly uh, plays a role, but this is the, the big one. And oh man, you can't see my arrow moving. This is a bummer. Next time, I'm, maybe next week, I'll do it on Zoom. Uh, so um, uh, staff, um, the, the number one thing that you can do for a kid that's having a terrible, terrible flare of um, atopic dermatitis is treat, treat their occult staph infection that may be hidden in a crust in, uh, on their legs, a crust uh, uh, behind their ear, uh, uh, and Keflex. Uh, uh, Keflex uh, is our number one go-to in, in dermatology. Um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, we like to take cultures, and when Keflex doesn't work, and if it turns up to be MRSA, we need to know that. So. Uh, cult taking cultures is important. Uh, Arrow allergens uh, controversial, um, but uh, if you have somebody with a really bad case, uh, getting a a, um, a filter uh, doesn't hurt. Uh, so just real quick, uh, uh, just a few unknowns give you a chance to test yourself. Um, risk, like identified atopic. Unknown unilateral, huh, unilateral, why would that be? So, and it's pretty bright red, so you find out they're a violin player. Um, and then this is just kind of a, a, a garden variety. Uh, this isn't bothering uh, the, the patient so much. They're just curious, what is it? I don't like it. This is your, your keratosis polaris. Okay, so how do we treat um, atopic uh, dermatitis? Subtract the soap, and then you can even use a soap substitute. Uh, Aveeno and Cetaphil um, are, are my favorites. There's, there are others. Um, and um, the main thing is uh, to protect your skin, what to, to subtract. Avoid this, avoid this, av avoid... Uh, 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 bathing and washing and using soaps unnecessarily. Um, uh, avoid uh, uh, abrasive wash washcloths. Um, uh, and uh, uh, in some cases, just tell the mother, look, just use the soap in the groin, um, maybe the uh, uh, axle and the feet, but uh, just keep the soap away. Um, completely. Um, now, what can we add? So this is my simplified version of steroids. There are um, really complex uh, uh, categories of, of steroids, and instead of having four categories, they have seven and unhelpfully use Roman numerals, and I hate it. Uh, so for, for me, uh, I have this simple uh, diagram. I have two um, in, uh, 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 candidates for each level. Um, and um, starting with the lowest level, uh, the workhorse here is hydrocortisone. Um, uh, Desonide is a little bit stronger and uh, Medi-Cal doesn't cover it, so that's why uh, uh, we have uh, these two uh, categories. Um, and this is what you use on the face and the genitalia in the inner trigo uh, areas. Inner trigo uh, skin on skin multiplies the effect of, of a steroid. So you put a strong uh, topical steroid in the inner trigo area, um, uh, you, you may uh, get some atrophy, uh, and you don't you don't want that. A medium, the workhorse is triamcinolone. 
um, the uh, uh, high level Lydex, um, fluocinonide. Um, there is a very strong uh, triamcinolone, um, the 0.5, as opposed to 0.05. Um, and so it's 20 times uh, stronger. And uh, there are some, unfortunately, uh, uh, pharmacy plans that don't cover Lydex. So you have to resort to the strong level of uh, triamcinolone. And then the highest level, the go-to is uh, uh, clobetazole or Temovate. Medi-Cal doesn't cover it. So then we go to uh, betamethasone uh, dipropionate. Make sure you have the right betamethasone. There's a uh, uh, betamethasone valerate that you can see under medium um, that uh, uh, might be you might uh, confuse. You're not giving something as strong as what you uh, you think. Um, so uh, the question of cream versus ointment. When you're dealing with that poison oak case that's that's juicy and acute, use cream. That'll dry that out. Um, but when you're you when you're using a topical for atopic cr dermatitis chronic and there's uh, lichenification and you want an ointment uh, for the same reason that you don't want to dry out the skin the ointment uh, uh, helps trap the the water in the skin and keeps it in the skin whereas the cream will uh, draw it draw it out so. Um, a common pitfall is, is to put your uh, uh, atopic patients on uh, cream, and uh, they should always uh, uh, be on anointment. Um, so I, I, I think a good rule of thumb for us primary care docs uh, is um, to uh, uh, you always use ointment unless you can think of some good reason to use a cream. Um, so what are the diseases? Uh, here, uh, they have clustered uh, 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 three levels of diseases. Um, we'll, we'll start with uh, the one on the furthest right, where you would use the weakest uh, steroids. That's for the eyelids, for the diaper area, which is uh, a lot of intertriginous and, and occluded. Sorry, that's my phone. Don't know who it is. Not somebody I know even. Uh, and on on the face, uh, also the the anus uh, and in in our tribe. Then over on the far left side are really the strong things that um, uh, that uh, are the uh, the strong things that require. The, the the strongest uh, steroids, and then in in the middle um, are uh, the uh, intermediate uh, uh, things. This is another uh, uh, list. This time there's there's four categories, um, with a helpful uh, uh, warning, and I'll just go through the warnings uh, from top down. Just the the, the uh, strong uh, steroids are not for the face, axillary groin, intertriginous, intertriginous under uh, breast, then you should try to limit. Um, the, the next level down, uh, uh, the atopic dermatitis in adults, the main indication, but don't use it uh, in, in those areas up, up at the top and lim limit it uh, in uh, the amount of time. Um, and how do you limit it? It's, it's pretty easy because patients don't like to put the stuff on their skin. So they often limit it uh, themselves. But for sure with kids where they're not in charge uh, and you have an overzealous uh, mother, you, you, you need to uh, uh, warn and, 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 and encourage them to taper off uh, the steroids as quickly uh, as as possible, and then at the uh, again at the bottom, the eyelid uh, diaper dermatitis, the the weakest steroids, um, and uh, uh, as important as the steroids are, uh, what are called moisturizer, and there's tons of moisturizers out there. 
and they're all fine. The, the, the patient needs to uh, experiment and find the one product that they like that they'll use and put on two to three times a day to keep their skin from drying out. Um, and so uh, we're adding a medicated uh, 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 topical, but we might also uh, consider uh, using the, the uh, over-the-counter uh, stuff. Um, and um, what I recommend you do if, uh, if you wind up practicing in California and you, and you want to review what over-the-counter stuff you should tell your patients to apply, go to your local Kaiser and just walk into their pharmacy. What they stock in their pharmacy is picked by their uh, dermatology department. That's not true for your Safeway and your CVS. Um, uh, uh, that, that, that's uh, whatever the market can uh, uh, bear and whatever gets uh, promoted and, and advertised. So uh, that's what I did. I went into the uh, my, the local pharmacy because uh, Tom Page told me he he worked at uh, Kaiser for uh, 30 years um, and, and was their uh, chief of dermatology in, at the Walnut Creek uh, Hospital. And uh, so I, I've I've gone in and I look and see what products uh, they stock and the, these are their moisturizers and uh, uh, their soap substitutes. Uh, you can see in the lower shelf uh, to the right the, the amlactin that I was talking about uh, to use on uh, keratosis uh, polaris um, and then the new kid on the block is is Cerave. Um, it's supposed to uh, ha have uh, a special uh, uh, beneficial uh, boost to the ceramides, which are a, a local um, uh, protective uh, chemical in, in uh, your skin. So, so CeraVe for that, the atopic dermatitis where the, the, the regular moisturizers aren't quite uh, uh, cutting it. All right, so this is going to be our segue patient. Um, for sure, this kid's got atopic dermatitis. So I'd be encouraging you to think about what else this kid might have. And you're saying to yourself, uh, oh, I think that kid also has um, staff. So this is our segue to infections of the skin, and in particular, folliculitis, folliculitis. So we've moved now from the common rash. Uh, we've covered the most common. Now we're at the second most common. Uh, and so let's look. Here we've got um, a, a super-infected uh, 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 eczema. And there is this awful um, uh, relationship between staph and uh, eczema. Um, eczema makes the skin more hospitable for staph, and staph is a super antigen for eczema. So you've got this vicious circle, um, and a good way to break into that circle is uh, to take a culture and give this kid Keflex. I would not wait for the culture result. If it comes, I'd start on Keflex. If it comes back uh, MRSA, then I'd switch him to Septra, just because Septra has a, a few more uh, allergic side effects. Um, this is keratosis polaris gone rogue. So it's not always uh, benign. And um, the uh, if, if they're also, if their resistance to staph is low, uh, ambient staph can uh, colonize um, uh, follicles uh, that are thickened by keratosis uh, polaris. Okay, remember this kid? He's got pityriasis alba. That's what the main thing we learned. But he very well could have a staph infection of his nose and be a nasal carrier of staph. 
so um, you might want to culture that. Um, the other thing that we can uh, do for in infections is uh, 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 to give muparison. Um, and instead of culturing, you can give a muparison standby, but you could just say, hey, uh, mom, for uh, just uh, uh, twice a day for a couple of weeks, just smudge a little bit of muparison in the opening uh, to, to his uh, nose. And the, uh, uh, you want to give them the muparison anyway and just have them do that first and you don't have to bother with the culture. Uh, and this is the culture. Um, uh, very simple to use. Um, you just rub it on uh, crusted areas. I, I think there's uh, sometimes you think, well, that's not going to be a very good uh, test. Uh, it is, though. It's highly sensitive and highly specific. They get this in the lab and they do uh, their thing, <clears throat> their microbiology thing, and and you get uh, pretty good uh, results, and you and you get the, the the sensitivities by by day three that can help guide the treatment. I'd say the one thing that we see in uh, dermatology uh, clinic that I I, uh, I wish I, I I would have remembered when I was doing primary care was to just do more cultures, particularly in complicated uh, recurrent uh, cases. Um, to have those culture results uh, uh, might help the person who's seeing this uh, patient in, in a couple of weeks because they're not getting better. Uh, so the, base, the basic thing, and <clears throat> my beef um, with the way the skin is designed, is the hair. I, I have no idea what the function of the hair is. I don't think the hair really contributes much. And what I, I see um, uh, 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 is just all the complications of hair. And yeah, okay, hair is a, a nice adornment uh, for us as uh, human beings. We, li we, we like to style up. But man, oh man, the problems that hair causes is just uh, staggering. And this is this is one of them. Uh, you get that blackhead, and then what happens behind the blackhead? You, uh, man, you can't see my arrow, but the, down the bottom, that yellow thing is the plug. The because uh, where you have hair, you've got to have oil, and oil uh, sebum uh, inspissates um, and uh, causes uh, the. Uh, oil to oxidize and turn black and and plug the hair follicle. And now you've got the, all the problems you get with stasis. We know stasis isn't good anywhere in the body. And so now you've got stasis, you get continued production of uh, uh, sebum and boom, out uh, it pops. And now uh, you've got inflammation. Um, not an infection, just uh, the triglycerides that are in sebum uh, cause uh, an inflammation. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and so then you, you get this uh, folliculitis, uh, and the nose is a, a common place where staph uh, can lurk and take advantage. So now we're dealing uh, with, with pustules big time. This is all still. Um, an epidermal uh, change, um, and uh, you go to your, once you've categorized your problem as pustular, you go to the chapter that's associated on that table, and you go, and the very first page is uh, common pustular diseases in primary care. And uh, we've already uh, uh, talked about um, uh, rosacea, uh, an, an impetigo folliculitis is, is where we're, we're at now. We'll be talking about uh, candidiasis, um, and there's some fungal uh, uh, pustular uh, manifestations as well, as I, I hope we'll get to. And then, of course, acne. <laughs> acne. Um, and so uh, uh, four of these are associated with, with hair follicles. Uh, rosacea isn't. Um, 
And so in really bad cases, you get recurrent staff, uh, people whose uh, resistance is, is low. Uh, this kid is uh, uh, recovering from um, bullous uh, impetigo um, and, and staph infections. Uh, re we see uh, patients with recurrent staph infections all the time in dermatology. And, and I, I saw some when I was doing primary care, which I, I was in, until about uh, five years ago. Um, and obviously, we get the uh, extreme, uh, the, the uh, abscesses. Um, and so what do you do to prevent that? Uh, we're primary care. We want to prevent stuff. Um, chlorhexidine used to be the only option. Uh, you have to prescribe it. I don't know why. <laughs> you can get chlorhexidine. Uh, for uh, pets uh, uh, without a prescription, by the way. Um, uh, and that's true for the mouthwash, too. You can get your uh, mouth, uh, uh, chlorhexidine mouthwash for your dog, but it, to get it for yourself, you've got to uh, get a prescription. Go figure. But uh, what Tom Page has taught us uh, in the last 10 years is uh, you can super chlorinate uh, your bath water and get almost as good a job, and it's much more convenient. Uh, so uh, Clorox, right off the shelf at Safeway. Uh, a quarter cup um, right into your uh, bathtub, uh, if you, they, and, you, and you'll run into patients who don't have bathtubs. Okay, okay, so do an eighth of a cup in, in a big basin and, and use compresses. Uh, uh, the, that, that's the way around uh, that. Um, I'm, I'm going to give us a break in five minutes, uh, so for those of you that are uh, uh, feeling the need to stand up and stretch or do something else, uh, five minutes, That's uh, and then we'll, we'll take a, a, a short break. Um, so here's my beef against hair, right? I just had to sit down and pencil this out and organize my thoughts because I was getting so agitated, <laughs> and already... Uh, we've talked about blackheads, comedones, folliculitis. Oh, you can't see my arrow. Damn. Uh, folliculitis over to impetigo. And we've, we've learned the interaction, the vicious circle between atopic uh, dermatitis and, and impetigo. Uh, and uh, we've uh, just gone up and looking on the right-hand side, the green. We've already talked about uh, the hair follicle and keratosis polaris, that uh, annoying uh, 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 variant of uh, the hair follicle. And before we're done, I hope, we'll be talking about uh, the tan color, the acne. Um, and quite soon, we're going to be talking also about mechanical, the uh, uh, epidermal inclusion. Um, uh, and and the um, uh, uh, there there there's some stuff that goes on in the in the skin uh, related uh, to the hair. Um, and we'll we'll be talking about as well. But it's not just this stuff. It's also the absence of hair, uh, and it's also too much hair. The cosmetic uh, uh, part, the 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 social part that uh, uh, we've elevated hair into all kinds of symbolic meaning. Um, I'll get back to that. Um, but here, let's just look at the, the, the different types of folliculitis. So, okay, yeah, bacterial, we all know that. Uh, but you can get a fungal uh, folliculitis, and I'll show you photos of that uh, after the break. Uh, obviously, you can get some viral type of uh, uh, inflammation of hair follicles, and surprisingly, you can get uh, some uh, uh, something called demodex. I'll show you a picture of that in, in just a second. But not all folliculitis is infectious. You can get irritant folliculitis from, say, waxing, um, and... Uh, you can get also bacterial folliculitis that isn't staph. You can get gram-negative folliculitis. 
which you have to wind up treating with Cipro instead of with Keflex. So sometimes it's uh, resistant cases. Take that history and maybe that's all you need is the history. But if you're not getting the history and nothing's working, take a culture. Um, you can get um, a folliculitis that's fungal, uh, tinea uh, barbie. That's not going to respond uh, to Keflex. You're, you're going to need to uh, uh, treat that um, uh, with a, a systemic uh, antifungal. Um, there are some things that can be uh, uh, follicular in uh, other uh, places, uh, uh, follicular and fungal, the groin. Uh, you can have tinea uh, causing a, a folliculitis um, in here. Um, and uh, this is an example of uh, folliculitis from um, uh, 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 microorganisms, uh, malafesia of furfur, we used to call it uh, 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 pityriasis ovale. Uh, they changed names on me. That's, that's really uh, not appreciated. Um, and uh, yeast, uh, uh, we know candida, but it can present as, as a, with a follicular component uh, as well. Um, it, it, you know, you can do uh, KOH, but you can't, nobody can do KOH in family practice clinic. And I do a lot of KOH. I can't. I, doing it in family practice clinic was a logistic impossibility. Um, so uh, I wanted to say a few things about uh, uh, treating um, uh, yeast and, and, and fungus. Uh, and there's, uh, there are a couple of pitfalls here. Uh, one is terbinafin, remember, does not cover uh, yeast. Um, and for some reason, iconazole uh, has some antibacterial activity, which I, I learned. But your conazoles will cover uh, both. When in doubt, uh, uh, and you're not sure, a conazole is, is uh, what you want. So there's holes. Remember, terbinafin does not get yeast. Griseofulvin does not get yeast. Nystatin is just the opposite. Nystatin will get yeast, but it doesn't get fungus. So just uh, these are pitfalls for primary care that you should you should be aware about. Um, and uh, I basically uh, said all that. I think if you're sure something is uh, a, a fungal, it's ringworm, it's got that telltale. Uh, a leading edge of, of scale, uh, uh, terbinafin is probably better than the conazoles, uh, but you got to be sure that there's no no fungus involved. Um, when 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 you're not sure uh, whether God could this be a, a yeast folliculitis, you could always culture, unroof one of those um, uh, uh, follicles and, and, uh, culture it either, uh, either one of these media, uh, you can, uh, use the open ring, uh, uh, forceps to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the open ring, uh, curette to, uh, get your specimen. Um, and I think we're almost at a spot. So scabies itself, Oh, there's one, I know a better spot. This will probably be a good place to stop. This is Demodex. Go figure, this lives in like 80% of hair follicles. Can you believe it? And it, it uh, I'm sorry, not 80% of hair follicles. 80% of people, you can find a hair follicle that has Demodex. Um, and there... It was so interesting that the California Academy of Science did a whole show on it, which if you're interested, I could send you that, that link. Um, I went, uh, and, and, and that it might be a part of rosacea uh, is suggested by how it responds to ivermectin or, or permethrin. Um, and this is where we'll stop. I'll, I'll come back to this. Um, and uh, give you all uh, a break. Just out of curiosity, how many do we have uh, today, Stephen? 
Um, it looks like right now we have 13 people total. Okay. All right, folks. So I'll see you back in five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Going okay, Stephen? Yeah, it's looking great. Um, yeah, it is frustrating that you can't use your pointer. Yeah. There is an option. I don't know how uh, into it you want to get, but there is an option. I, I can do it from my side. I don't really know what it looks like on your side where you can draw on your slides from Teams. Um, if you want to do your uh, presentation again, I can try it on my side and we can we can look into that feature if you think it's beneficial. OK, maybe next week. OK, All right. I, 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 I'm loath to try to do anything right in the middle midstream. Sure. Well, you could also plan for Zoom next week as well. That would be OK. OK. Yeah, 13 people should be doable. Mm -hmm.
Okay, folks, it's been uh, five minutes. I'll go ahead and get started if I hear that one person responds. I'm here. Uh, okay, that's good enough for me. Off we go. Now, do you do you see a, a photo of a guy? Yes. OK, good. We're off and running. So um, th this is not infectious, not infectious. If this is not an, and this is not infectious. If this is not infectious, what could it be put on your detective hat? And we're in now to the area of hair too much, too little, and uh, mechanical blockage. Um, and this is pseudofolliculitis. Um, and it's uh, purely uh, a result of the hair curving back in into the skin. It's a thing um, in... Uh, uh, African American men, um, and so uh, it's listed uh, as part of uh, mechanical. Um, and there's a whole uh, program for treating this. We I won't go into it uh, now, uh, but it's quite uh, involved and uh, specific on all the things that can be done to keep the hair from curving into the skin. Also, a, a plague, a plague of, uh, for uh, 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 men of color is uh, this uh, acne keloides nuke, which we treat just the way we would treat acne on the face. Unfortunately, it can become uh, quite severe and, and lead to keloids, uh, thus the name. There's also in uh, uh, men of color um, this dissecting cellulitis of uh, the scalp, uh, which has to be controlled uh, with antibiotics um, and can be uh, quite uh, uh, debilitating, cosmetically at least. Um, and then, uh, besides the mechanical, let's let's add the purely cosmetic: too much hair and too little hair. So hirsutism. I'm going to cover that when we do uh, acne, because there's a lot of uh, uh, other skin problems behind hirsutism that that come with uh, um, uh, 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 besides hirsutism and acne that I'll talk about. Um, and uh, and then too little hair. Uh, mainly alopecia areata, uh, which is uh, stress-related, fairly uh, common. Exclamation hairs at the uh, edge of the bald spot can be temporary. Uh, again, uh, uh, autoimmune, so we treat it with uh, uh, corticosteroids topically, or in severe cases, we inject um, uh, 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 triamcinolone into the into the skin, Kenalog into the skin, uh, to be uh, not to be confused with the hair loss from uh, tinea capitis, and the difference you can see is the black dots, and uh, the black dots uh, uh, are from destroyed hair that is being eaten up by uh, uh, the tinea. Then you get the problem of uh, a hair loss from te too much testosterone, uh, uh, male pattern uh, baldness, um, 
a female pattern hair loss where the balance between androgens uh, and estrogens uh, are out of whack. Uh, 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 that's not in my, my uh, top 20 problems. If we have time, we'll come back to it. And then uh, the final hair problem that you've all uh, been involved with uh, taking care of, I hope, in minor surgery clinic is getting rid of these uh, uh, epidermal inclusion cysts, EICs. Uh, they, we used to call them sebaceous cysts, but they keep changing names on me, so I have to uh, keep up. Um, and uh, this is nothing more than a, a, a comedone uh, over a long period of time where, and you that have done the surgery and you've uh, oh, uh, inadvertently opened up one of these things, know that it's, it's not pus, it's uh, a, a, a groomous combination of uh, old sebum and old hair that's 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 been uh, blocked. Um, usually with a central pore um, that you can use to uh, direct where you're you're gonna uh, do your surgery. Either you can uh, try to excise uh, uh, the whole thing with a, a, a long ellipse, or you can uh, do just take your mosquito clamp. Um, uh, make a, a short clip and try to extract uh, the contents. Um, and uh, if you're lucky, there's a, a, enough of a capsule that you can use a second clamp to kind of tease uh, that out. Uh, you have to explore the base and make sure you've got all, all the stuff. And then you leave it open. It's just uh, in the upper dermis, right? It's not going all the way through the skin. There's dermis below it, so the skin has integrity and it can heal by secondary um, intention. It's easiest if it's in the scalp. Uh, uh, it, it, quite simple to do because the uh, uh, cyst wall is uh, nice and, and firm. And you can just pull the whole uh, thing out. Um, and again, you can uh, leave it open. Um, if it's small, you can put a stitch in if you want to. Um, and uh, now that was the segue uh, for growths. Um, and here we have growths in the uh, epidermis. There's quite a few. And then we do have some growths in the dermis that we'll talk about. So this brings us to the fourth category, keratoses. And there's two different kinds of individual keratoses, seborrheic and actinic. And then we're going to be also dealing with the growth of warts uh, in this section. So we'll start off with the wart. Um, and uh, this is uh, the rendering of it by looking, Bill, right, sitting right on top. Not, doesn't go down into the uh, dermis. Um, this is molluscum. It's got that little uh, central uh, dimple. And uh, again, uh, you see there are molluscum bodies, specific molluscum bodies that um, uh, uh, you can uh, destroy. So uh, the favorite uh, method for destroying uh, warts is... Uh, to use liquid nitrogen. Uh, you have a delivery uh, system uh, in the drawer of your examining table. You just find your GYN swab and you, you spin the tip into uh, uh, something serviceable that you can dip into liquid nitrogen and you, uh, you freeze it. Um, you, you, you just keep freezing it until the whole thing freezes plus a one to two millimeter uh, rim. Um, and what that does is it creates an ice ball that goes down. So the ice ball uh, will, will go down about half the distance um, across, right? Because the, the distance across is uh, the diameter and, and the distance the ice ball goes down is going to be a, a 
uh, half of that, uh, the radius of your ice ball. And that's usually uh, enough. So if you get a one millimeter um, edge, uh, that, that'll, be, that'll be your guide. And this is what should happen. Uh, it should uh, cause necrosis um, and destroy uh, the upper part uh, of, of the dermis. And so you deliberately uh, kill the, the, the uh, wart and the skin right, right around it and rely on the, the healing mechanisms. All right, so uh, very common, uh, seborrheic keratosis, uh, waxy, stuck on appearing, sharp edge, um, uh, can be scaly uh, and, uh, and uh, usually um, uh, comes in clusters. So what, um, what's the neighborhood look like? Um, what uh, you, uh, 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 one concept I want to introduce is the concept of the ugly duckling, the, the, the thing that doesn't belong because uh, we're looking for uh, pigmented lesions, which uh, uh, scare us, but all, it looks like most of these belong in the neighborhood. Um, in uh, people of color, uh, these can appear as very small uh, lesions on the f face, particularly uh, around uh, uh, the eyes. Uh, uh, these are all uh, seborrheic keratoses. Uh, these are dermatosis papulosis nigrans, uh, DPN. Um, and you can uh, uh, treat these the way you treat any seborrheic keratosis. They're just sitting on top of the skin. So you can freeze them off. Um, you can burn them off. This is the hyphricator. This is the hyphricator uh, tip. Um, this is the uh, application of uh, uh, the, the hyphricator. It doesn't matter whether you desiccate which is B, or you fulgurate, uh, which is A. Fulguration means lightning, so it means just hovering above the skin. Uh, but I think that's just an academic uh, distinction without meaning. Uh, uh, the companion uh, instrument to pick up with the hyphricator is the curette. Uh, it's got a, a very dull edge, and it's got a, a kind of semi-sharp edge. It's not very sharp, and that's what you want. You want to be able to scrape without cutting. Um, now, that some of the disposable curettes are so sharp that you, you, you run the danger of, of cutting, and you don't want to have to cut. Um, so I, I prefer uh, the... Uh, um, uh, I prefer the open ring curette um, uh, uh, reusable. Um, uh, mastoid curette when you have to dig something out. Um, and um, here is a corn. Uh, how do you know it's a corn? It's right in the middle of a callus, right in the middle of a, a callus. Um, and the skin lines don't diverge around them as it would in, in a wart. Um, and here is uh, your uh, highly sophisticated uh, treatment tool. You don't even need the, the scalpel handle, um, uh, but you certainly can use it. Uh, but uh, you, you shave that uh, thing uh, down. I just start working on it. Um, this is uh, uh, from a slide, I, I, an old slide I had. I made a new slide uh, last week when my son, who was visiting, um, said, Dad, I've got something painful on the side of my foot. I can hardly walk on it. And I looked at it. I said, OK, this, this looks like it's a corn. It's right in the middle of a, a callus. Um, so, uh, without gloves, uh, I, I started shaving that sucker down. And you just keep shaving and exposing and shaving and exposing. And then ultimately, you get to a place where you can see a corn. And you take the sharp end of your scalpel and you flip it out. It's like taking the rock out of somebody's shoe. 
And I've said it's one of my favorite procedures. This is my son. I stay six feet away from him because he's six feet tall and I was working on his foot. Um, and uh, the, my favorite thing is, OK, stand up and tell me. And so put your weight on, on the bad foot and you put the weight on the bad foot and you immediately get gratitude. Um, and uh, to prove that it was actually me, I removed the mask and here he is, the proud possessor, and he, he's very happy. I just want to show you and uh, distinguish that from a planner wart. So a planner wart, um, uh, the, the skin lines typically will go through. Uh, there's not a, a huge callus around that. It's not in the middle of a, a callus. It's very painful. And when you, uh, you shave the first few layers, you, you can see bleeding points. So this is a bigger deal. You're not going to be able to flip this out in, in your backyard in a short amount of uh, time. Uh, you put in a lot of, of uh, lidocaine and, and you take your, your hyphercator and uh, desiccate it. Uh, and then you take your mastoid curette and you start working on it and you flip it out. And it's, it's huge. They go quite deep. Now you've got kind of a hole, but it's not exposed very well. So you trim the edges with your scissors, and then you, you take your open ring curette and you just create a uh, curette radially ar around it. Um, and then you, uh, you finish off by, uh, uh, with a big hole, but you uh, 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 hypercate the base, you burn the, uh, the base, this is not something that is quick and easy like a corn. And, you know, if you're in a certain situation, you become a, a dermatology registrar, uh, learn to do it, but otherwise uh, refer it on. The, uh, it was, it's always nerve wracking the first uh, five times you do it because you think you're going to wind up in the plantar fascia. Um, okay, so now we're moving into the uh, next category, the zipping right down our list. And I want to talk about uh, uh, growths that are cancerous. And most of those are um, a basal cell. Um, we did a study uh, and uh, in one year, 85% uh, of the cancers that we saw in, uh, here at this part of California we're basal cell. It's obviously going to change uh, uh, where, wherever uh, you might wind up. Uh, and only uh, uh, seven out of um, around 200 uh, were melanoma, uh, so 4%. Um, and squamous cell is kind of in, in intermediate, but way less, way less than, than basal cell. Um, and that's because uh, we are in one of the few Mediterranean climates of the world. There's not many. And um, uh, people from uh, Northern Europe being descend aggressive descendants of Vikings um, have spread out uh, in places in the world where they're not supposed to be. Um, and uh, one of them is, is right here uh, in California. The other place uh, not on this map is New Zealand, and that's why DermNet uh, is located in New, New Zealand. They have uh, a lot of skin cancer as, as well. Um, so uh, the three kinds of uh, uh, skin cancer, um, you, you have uh, uh, the, the basal cells. Oh, you can't see me. I keep... The basal cells at the, uh, in the, the lower left-hand uh, square, um, the basal cells are uh, right there where you'd expect they to be at the base of the epidermis, squamous cells uh, above them. Um, and then melanocytes, uh, uh, that big uh, uh, whitish cell in, in, in the middle. Um, and um, th this is how uh, it get, they get started. The squamous cells uh, being more superficial, you'd think they'd be more benign, but they're not. They're a little bit more aggressive than basal cells. Basal cells are almost always um, uh, localized, um, which gives us uh, more options uh, for treatment. 
uh, melanomas are what uh, scare us all. Uh, and they can, because they, they can dive deep and get into the lymph uh, system and, and, uh, uh, and create all kinds of uh, problems. But by far and away, the basal cells are the most uh, common that you'll see in family practice and also what you can attack uh, most easily in, in family practice. So again, we look at looking, Bill, and we see the basal cells don't go all the way down to the bottom of the dermis. They're in the upper part of the dermis. There's little nests of them, um, uh, little fingers that stick off from uh, where um, the, uh, the, the, the most obvious uh, lump is. Um, and um, uh, if you look at the different types of basal cells, uh, and where they're located, we can treat about 60% of them in family practice clinic, and, and we can uh, uh, destroy them. Uh, so this is a basal cell, telangiectasias, uh, uh, pearliness, uh, uh, part of it, um, and uh, uh, most of them are nodular, 28% uh, are superficial. So these uh, comprise the 60% that we are that we can treat quite easily in a family practice uh, clinic. You don't want to treat micronodular infiltrative uh, or, or morpheiform uh, sclerosing. They're more um, problematic and a little bit more aggressive. But the 60% uh, you can you can treat. So so how would you uh, treat um, uh, uh, nodular basal cells like like these. Um, uh, this one is near an orifice. Uh, maybe uh, when they're near an orifice, you have to be a little more careful. Maybe that's when we would um, send our um, a patient on to the plastic surgeon. Some basal cells can be pigmented. You would do a punch biopsy of this sucker to be sure, but it, it, it would come back uh, a pigmented basal cell. And this is obviously in an orifice, so this would be one that you'd send definitely right straight to the, the plastic surgeon. Um, but if, if it's on the back and it's nodular, uh, you can pick up your open ring curette, and after you put in some lidocaine, uh, you just scrape the heck out of it. And then you're gonna burn the, the base of it. So this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna do that for three cycles. So you pick up your open ring curette and you just, you can scrape real hard without cutting. Um, make sure it's not one of those sharp disposable ones. You scrape real hard without cutting and basal cells can't take that kind of pressure and they just peel right off and they're uniformly round, perfectly round. They're not aggressive in one direction or another. They're an equal opportunity invader. And so you're gonna get a nice round defect. And then with that nice round defect that you've created with your curette, you're gonna color it black uh, with, with your desiccator. Um, and then you're going to pick up your curette and you're going to uh, curette off all that black stuff and create and, 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 and create uh, 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 that again. And then uh, you're going to do that uh, a second time and then you're going to do it a third time. Three cycles, um, uh, C and D times three, curettage and, and desiccation times uh, three. And um, because these things don't go all uh, to the bottom of the dermis, you, you, there's no reason for a garden variety basal cell that you have to do a full thickness excision with stitches. Now you do if it's, there's a cosmetic issue, um, but you, you don't uh, ordinarily. Um, so here are, are just a few uh, caveats um, 
uh, on the nose where an awful lot of basal cells are, uh, you shouldn't attack anything greater than six millimeters for sure. Uh, anything near an eyelid um, uh, or the uh, vermilion border of the lip, uh, you, you don't you don't want to do. Uh, Mohs surgery, um, sometimes the plastic surgeon will make the, the determination that Mohs would be a, a better option where you shave and do uh, frozen sections and shave and do frozen sections all in one one setting. Um, and uh, that's something different. Superficial uh, basal cells are eminently uh, treatable. Um, the you do your your biopsy um, and when, when you're dealing with what you think is a basal cell just do a shave biopsy you don't have to do a punch biopsy a punch biopsy goes all the way through the skin and uh, uh, it creates uh, you lose the integrity of the skin so if you want to uh, 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 curette that later on you don't you don't want to have to be curetting over a hole so a shave biopsy where you're, you're, uh, you think you're dealing with the basal cell is the best way to go to prepare for a, a destructive treatment uh, uh, later on. Um, uh, a typical superficial basal cell, um, uh, I've seen uh, uh, some dermatologists that say, hey, that's obviously um, a superficial basal cell. Let's just treat them with Aldera and see what happens. Um, and so uh, uh, a miquamod, uh, how does it work? It leverages the immune system of the skin, the T cells in the skin. Um, for some reason, some of them are called Langer uh, hand cells. Um, and that's how a miquamod uh, works. Um, you can also uh, use... Uh, 5-FU, but you have to do it more often, and you have to do it for a longer period of time, 5-FU uh, cream, 5%. Uh, 5 um, uh, the, the sclerosing, uh, you don't want to, you, you want to send that right on to the plastic surgeon. If it looks like that and the biopsy comes back saying morphia forms sclerosing, hand, hands off. Um, so uh, I could show you a lot more pictures of basal cell uh, cancers, but why don't you uh, go to uh, DermNet uh, NZ and uh, uh, take take a look. Uh, so that'll give us more time to talk about uh, uh, keratoses, um, and we've already talked about seborrheic keratoses. They're, they're simple; they have no malignant p potential whatsoever. Actinic keratoses do, and in fact, sometimes they're considered precancerous or in situ cancerous. Uh, in the beginning, they, uh, dermatologists were doing that to get higher reimbursement until their uh, grift was figured out. Um, and uh, they can uh, uh, evolve if they're not treated in the uh, full-fledged uh, squamous cells. So this is uh, a typical uh, cluster of actinic uh, keratoses. They're, 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 they feel rough. They're not waxy. Um, and patients awful say, often say they hurt. Um, Seborrheic keratoses never hurt. Um, uh, but they're inflamed and they, they can hurt. Um, so uh, this is looking, Bill, uh, which shows us what a, a actinic keratosis uh, uh, looks like it's uh, this one's it's it's all in the epidermis. In fact, there is a definition of uh, uh, actinic keratosis that for sure, if it's less than two thirds of the epidermis, it's it's actinic keratosis. In situ um, is 100 percent, but uh, not into the dermis. It's in situ, and then people argue, well, what's 90? What's 80? Uh, and it, it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary. 
Um, but for sure, when it goes into the dermis, you're dealing with a, a, a squamous cell CA. I, I'm sorry if I'm not clear when I move. I'm, I'm seeing myself move around the <laughs> cursor, and you're not seeing it. Maybe we'll try to correct that next week. Uh, Stephen has some ideas. Um, so here are um, actinic keratoses. Um, uh, and uh, A, uh, B, C, and D are, 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 are actinic keratoses. You get into E, F, and G, and oh, wait a minute, uh, maybe we're dealing with something that's invaded uh, the dermis, and you don't know until you do a biopsy uh, how, deep, uh, how deep it goes. And if, for sure, if it goes into the dermis, you're dealing, uh, you can't just freeze those. Uh, you can't just uh, uh, freeze those. On the lip, it's always a problem because uh, the lip uh, catches a little more sun, especially the lower lip. This one, uh, B, is the upper lip. Um, uh, and uh, you have to be careful about the lip. Some uh, uh, actinic keratoses are just really awful. And this is a uh, light skin northern european who's been in the mediterranean climate for their life working outside and uh, we've seen roofers that uh, uh, we could see every week uh, and uh, not get anywhere so the here is where 5fu uh, might come in uh, to play you have to use it uh, uh, for six weeks instead of two weeks and something like this for um, uh, uh, mild actinic keratoses of the face, uh, two weeks will be an, uh, enough, but uh, actinic keratosis, this much involvement in, in the scalp uh, uh, might require uh, six weeks. So 5-FU, um, 5%. Um, and then uh, where you have a widespread uh, skin damage over a, a large area, you can treat uh, uh, preventively uh, uh, so that um, preventive in the sense of uh, preventing a, a large area of sun damage from evolving to a squamous cell. Uh, but it, it involves an, an investment uh, of uh, coming up with uh, um, the uh, uh, a period of time uh, the, the, the worst time to do this is around the holidays because nobody wants to look like this over the holidays. Um, so uh, uh, another case uh, of somebody who went through uh, 5-FU. In situ, uh, cancer can look impressive. Uh, and you, you do your biopsy and you think for sure, oh, this is going to be invasive but it turns out to be just uh, in situ and you can use your 5-FU. Um, uh, special case, leukoplakia, the lower lip, um, uh, uh, precancerous, the same um, implication of, of cervical uh, dysplasia, you wanna get rid of it. Um, freezing, shaving, um, and again, the, uh, this is something you'd wanna biopsy and maybe do a wide, uh, 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 shave. Okay, other kinds of cancers. Uh, now let's just talk about frank squamous cell um, and uh, uh, horn, uh, horny growth um, can uh, uh, be the dominant uh, part of the presentation. Uh, scalloped uh, uh, borders, crusting, um, uh, the uh, ulcer. Uh, this is a special kind of keratoacanthoma, very fast growing with a central um, depression, uh, dimple almost, um, that uh, uh, is uh, one way for uh, uh, squamous cell uh, to present. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Page prefers the squamous cell be taken care of, as he says, with cold steel. Uh, some textbooks uh, say that uh, selected squamous cells you can also destroy. Uh, uh, we haven't been doing that because of Dr. Page's uh, uh, preference, but 
uh, Habif, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about Habif in just a second, uh, just uh, uh, recommends that, that that's a, a, an option for squamous, for selected squamous cell at once. So I'm not spending much time on squamous cell. It's only 10% of uh, our cancers uh, in, in Northern California, uh, assuming our patients are representative. Um, and, and it's only intermediate danger. So uh, go to um, uh, DermNet NC and type in uh, squamous cell and spend three minutes just looking at, at that uh, and more if you want. Uh, but we, uh, we'll say we'll spare some of our time for other things. The big thing and the thing that bu bugs me is the, the, uh, the pigmented uh, lesions. We've already talked about uh, pigmented uh, uh, seborrheic keratosis, pigmented basal cells, but uh, always in the back of our mind in dermatology is uh, the damn uh, uh, possibility of melanoma. And the fact that there's so many other pigmented types, you've got the needle in the haystack. I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the haystack, just so you know what the denominator is. And for the numerator, you can go to DermNet, uh, NZ, and, and take a look. Um, but uh, malignant melanomas, and here we're looking for the ugly duckling. And it can be either darker than everybody else, or it could be lighter than everybody else. Sometimes the uh, immune system uh, uh, sees a, a malignant melanoma and uh, attacks it and it becomes paler. Uh, rare, rare. Um, and obviously the standalone, it's not even uh, in an, uh, among other ducklings, it's, uh, there it is. So um, you go to pigmented lesions and looking, Bill, and here they all are. Um, so right there, smack dab in the middle are, is melanoma, but surrounded in, on either side are, are the other uh, haystack uh, uh, lesions. And I want to talk about those first, and then we'll spend a, a few minutes on melanoma, and that'll probably be where, well, where we'll end. That looks like I've got another uh, 12 minutes. Um, so the haystack, freckles, um, uh, individuals, uh, uh, and, and where where's the pathology? Well, thank you, looking Bill. You see uh, the pigmented area. Uh, uh, no, you can't see my arrow. Uh, on uh, in looking Bill, um, and uh, now you get confluent uh, pigmentation. That's melasma, but it's in the same location. The pigmentation's in the same location. Uh, and then um, at the bottom, you maybe notice the, the nevus. So the nevus is something different. <laughs> There's a, a nevus cell. Um, this doesn't come from the melanocytes at the bottom of the epidermis. This, this is actually uh, nevi cells. Um, and uh, this is from uh, uh, Habif. This is not in Looking, Bill. Um, so when you want a little bit more detail, uh, uh, Habif is the one. And, and a new Habif just came out last March, so it's it's really a, a nice time to buy it. It's available also on, it's H-A-B-I-F. I'll show you the cover a little bit later on. Um, but it gives you a little bit more detail and a lot more graphics and a lot more photos. Uh, 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 than looking bill does. Um, and so we're looking at, at three different um, uh, levels. We're looking at the junctional nevus, the compound nevus, and the dermal uh, uh, nevus. So the junctional uh, nevus, uh, uh, usually pretty, pretty flat, uh, doesn't go deep in the, the dermis. The compound nevus goes uh, a little bit uh, uh, deeper in the dermis, but, but uh, puffs up, uh, creating a dome uh, a, a little bit more. Uh, and then finally you get the, the dermal nevus. Um, and this is all part of the same process and, and nevi cell can evolve over a, a lifetime. Um, and the interesting thing is that they can degenerate too. 
So uh, towards the end of life, they start to, to degenerate solving the problem. But uh, obviously a, a cosmetic problem, a differential with basal cell can be in the here you got telangiectasia. How do I know that's not a basal cell? Well, the patient tells you they've had that. So history is so important. The patient tells you, oh, I've had that since, since I was 20. Um, some of the uh, 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 can be uh, uh, pedunculated. Uh, how do you, do you treat that? Like, that's like a skin tag almost. Um, and uh, either one, you can just snip off. Um, you take your scissors, you go down about one fourth um, uh, the distance of, of your cutting edge, and then uh, uh, you rock the, the sides back and forth uh, so to help seat at uh, the uh, level of the cutting edge at the lowest level of, of the skin in a sudden snip. Um, you can do that and without anesthesia. Um, putting in the anesthesia causes as much pain as uh, just snipping uh, some of these things off. Now, if they've got a wide base, uh, no, no, put in anesthesia if you don't think you're going to get it in one snip. Um, congenital uh, nevi, uh, uh, not for you to worry about. You refer those if it's greater than uh, 1.5 centimeters. Uh, uh, greater than 20 centimeters is, is uh, 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 almost uh, an emergency, so uh, for sure. But uh, the intermediate between 1.5 and 20, let your dermatologist sort that out. Um, atypical nevi. So now uh, uh, we're not dealing just with uh, junctional uh, compound and nodular. Uh, now we've got something else going on. It's a genetic uh, pre a predilection for uh, some of these nevi cells to become more complex. And when they become more complex, then you run into the problem of differentiating them uh, from uh, uh, mel melanomas. So um, uh, what is an atypical nevi? Uh, it has to be greater than five. There's irregular uh, uh, borders, irregular margins, the same kind of red flags that we have for uh, melanomas, varying shades, uh, so variegated. Um, and uh, what are the risk factors? So this is a real complicated relative risk uh, uh, table that shows that a, uh, a, a, atypical uh, moles can can give you a greater uh, risk of, of melanomas. Um, and you, you go on down, we can't spend much time on, on this, but uh, it's a real thing. Um, so where do you look and where are you most concerned? If you look, the upper back is the most worry, worrisome, uh, the densest, uh, uh, spot in men and women, but look at the uh, legs of women, uh, another uh, dense spot. So be particularly concerned in those areas, but you have to be kind of concerned everywhere. Um, okay, uh, so uh, now we get to the actual uh, uh, malignant melanomas. Here's a real ugly duckling. Uh, uh, it's asymmetrical, uh, A, B, C, D, E, you all know this, um, uh, uh, variegated uh, colored diameter greater than, than six millimeters and an evolving history, most important. And, and, and this is, this is, uh, is that in, in pictures. Uh, they'll add an E, A, B, C, D, E, evolution, changing. Uh, and again, the ugly duckling, uh, and here's an ugly duckling, okay. And here's an ugly duckling. Lentigo maligna can be kind of subtle. This is more obvious, but obviously you get uh, uh, solar lentigo on the face and sometimes, yeah, huh, what, what, this is a, a liver spot. Right? But look, if, it, if it's uh, this dark and it's got um, uh, it's this much variegation, you got to be suspicious of lentigo maligna. It's in situ, so uh, but over time they uh, uh, stop being in situ. 
lentigo maligna, lentigo uh, m- maligna. So um, a regular uh, solar or actinic lentigo uh, will be um, uh, uh, not as uh, st- stark as this. So I could show you more pictures of uh, malignant melanoma, but I'd rather you uh, do that uh, on your own uh, time, spend as much time as you want, um, and uh, uh, just, uh, uh, again, uh, where the Mediterranean climates are, um, the uh, uh, sunscreen. Uh, that's uh, uh, we're, we're family practitioners. We're interested in in prevention, uh, and so uh, 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 they ask you what, what sunscreen do you recommend? Run down to your Kaiser Pharmacy, like I did, and take a picture of their favorite sunscreens. Um, all right. So I was going to throw up. Uh, I've got uh, looks like four more minutes. Um, I'll just go through these just to give you all a chance to uh, test yourself. Um, Think to yourself, think to yourself, um, basal cell near the lips. Think to yourself, think to yourself, uh, probably seborrheic keratosis. And all all superficial, all superficial. So you can, the most... uh, 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 egregious ones that are bothersome, you can freeze off and destroy them using the methods we talked about. Um, uh, so actinic keratosis, um, uh, squamous cell uh, cancer could be basal cell because there's some pearliness. Uh, this is a, a, a typical nevus. Uh, This is basal cell of the leg. Um, This is uh, actinic uh, keratosis, but you got to be careful about that ear. Uh, There's a real crusted one there. You might want to shave that one. But this guy would be a candidate for 5-FU. You maybe could prevent him a lot of problems in the future. Um, th- this is a, a, a horny growth, uh, uh, a telltale sign of squamous cell. Uh, again, an atypical nevus. Atypical uh, nevus looks like a fried egg. Um, uh, uh, a uh, superficial uh, squamous cell, probably. Uh, you biopsy it, but uh, you want to be uh, sure that it's uh, superficial, but probably superficial. Terrible actinic keratosis could benefit from a long spell of 5-FU, um, uh, six weeks worth. Um, uh, uh, probably a, a squamous cell, but there, if, if he says it's uh, painful, there's something called an ear corn that is, is not um, uh, a, a cancer. Uh, you'd, wor- you'd worry a lot about uh, th- this degree uh, of, of scaling. Um, a keloid, um, a, a keratoacanthoma, uh, an ugly duckling. And uh, 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 this sometimes you just see something and you're not sure what, what's going on. I showed this to Tom Page and he said, I don't know. And so we biopsied it. All right. So when we start next week, I'll start with uh, uh, doing biopsies, um, uh, just a review of uh, uh, techniques and and indications. Um, uh, If anybody is uh, has questions, uh, uh, I'm I'm available. Thank you so much. I'll sit here a few minutes and if anybody has questions, I'll I'll respond. That's great. Thank you. My pleasure. See you see you next week if I don't get any questions.
Okay, Stephen, I guess that's it. Yes. Do you want to meet ahead of time before next week to go over anything, or do you want to just uh, commit to Zoom for next week? So, how would uh, how would I uh, transfer from? Show me how to transfer from uh, Teams to Zoom. Probably what I would do um, if you have a Zoom ID that you use, I would post that in um, the calendar, and you would just go to your Zoom meeting ID as usual, and the residents will know to go to that Zoom ID when it comes time for your presentation. Oh, okay. So uh, l let me see if I can post something on calendar. So I'll just go to calendar now. Um, actually, you don't worry about that. I'll, I'll post the calendar. Uh, all you have to do is provide me with the meeting ID that you would use for oh, the uh, Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Um, okay. Uh, so it's it is it the meeting ID or my own? There's two two things that I I see on Zoom. It's a meeting ID, but a, also a participant number. So this is the meeting ID, right? And is there just one meeting ID? I mean, is that well? I always I used uh, Zoom uh, in my clinic to see patients, and so that would be the same meeting ID. I would, I would guess so. Everyone has a personal meeting ID when they have a Zoom account. So, okay. and it's, yeah, it's usually called a uh, meeting ID. So I think as long as you find that, then those numbers are usually your personal one. Okay. All right, uh, so we can try it. If it doesn't work, we'll just go back to Teams. Yeah, that works, and I can meet you early as well. Um, okay, let's do that. Then, then, then we can set up and make sure you can get on my Zoom, and if you can, then we'll assume they can too. Yep, but go ahead and send that to me earlier than later, probably before the end of this week, so I can schedule that um, calendar event. Yeah, I'll send it to you within five minutes. Okay. All right, Stephen. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.